Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Chapter 6 of Language, Truth, and Logic, A.J. Ayer is going to provide criticisms of three main classes of ethical theories that were quite prevalent in ethics in his time. He, he views these as really the, the only main contenders that he has to go against. And we can call these the subjectivist, the utilitarian, and absolutist approaches in ethics. So who would we associate with those? Well, you know, the later on W.D. Ross and his intuitionist theory would fall into the absolutist uh, view, I think. Immanuel Kant definitely does, and Ayer talks about him. The utilitarians, of course, would be Bentham, uh, John Stuart Mill, Henry Sidgwick, and even uh, more to a certain extent. And then there was a whole bunch of different subjectivists out there in ethics at the time as well, most of whom are, are not very well known, so we don't have to talk about them. And Ayer's own view is that ultimately fundamental ethical concepts are um, pseudo-concepts and they're unanalyzable in terms of anything empirical. They can't be verified. They, in some respect, don't do anything more than, than convey our own moral sentiments or preferences or desires or our, our approval or disapproval. And he thinks that the other approaches in ethics have gone wrong largely by thinking that they're not dealing with pseudo-concepts or pseudo-propositions. So he talks about this project of reducing ethical or value statements and terms to non-ethical terms. This is a very common uh, project, not just in ethics, but in, in metaphysics and in all sorts of other language as well trying to reduce things down to a set of basic concepts that would all be on the same level. So Ayer thinks that this is really going to turn out to be impossible, but not for the reasons that, for example, the absolutists will think. And he's going to examine each of these in turn. So he tells us that this notion that ethical terms can be reduced or translated into non-ethical terms, whether statements of ethical value can be translated into statements of empirical fact, that this is a contention of two sets of, of ethical philosophers, those who are commonly called subjectivists, those who are known as utilitarians. So let's start with the subjectivists first. The subjectivists are saying that Ethical terms like right and good can, in fact, be translated into empirical concepts or statements. And what would they be translating them into? So he tells us that the rightness of actions and the goodness of ends can be translated for the subjectivist into terms of the feelings of approval which a certain person or group of people has towards them. Likewise, disapproval as well for the, the bad or the wrong. So this is saying that there's really two variations here. There is the individualistic variation, which says that what I mean when I say that something is good or right is that I approve of it. And there could be all sorts of reasons why I approve of it. If we go a little bit deeper, it could be because it stokes my ego. It could be because it satisfies my basic needs. It could be because I was brought up in such a way that I, I think that this is, you know, the way that I ought to approve and disapprove. We could go on and on and on. It doesn't matter really at this level of analysis. 
All that it has to do is, you know, revolve around approval by myself. It could also be the approval of the group. So it could be, I'm a member of the police department. I come in, I get indoctrinated. This is the way that cops behave. This is what they approve of. It doesn't necessarily map on to what other people do, but hey, that doesn't matter because I'm in this group. What is right or what is good is what a group approves of. And it could be, you know, there could be another group down the street uh, who has, you know, very different things, uh, very different uh, prioritizations or evaluations of these sorts of things. So right or good becomes merely approval or disapproval. Now, Ayer says that there's a problem with this. Why? He says, we reject the subjectivist view that to call an action right or a thing good is to say that it is generally approved of. Why? Because it's not self-contradictory to say, to assert is his term, that some actions which are generally approved of are not right, or that some things which are generally approved of are not good. Insofar as we can stand back and take a perspective that says, yes, yes, I understand that, for example, um, I'll take a real, really silly example. I understand that for the most part, everybody views uh, chewing gum in the classroom and sticking it underneath the table as a very small thing, but it's still wrong, right? Uh, or it's, it's, it's a bad thing to do. We could use wrong or bad. So long as we can think that something that's generally approved of could still be wrong, then, you know, there's a pr problem with this subjectivist ethic in terms of groups. We might also use something like, you know, where there's been some moral progress, you know, in, in most cultures, once they reach a certain level of civilization, they had something like chattel slavery as an institution. And nowadays we view that as wrong. And at some points in time, different peoples in different places change that. Um, so we can look at it and say, well, that was morally ap approved of by that group, but it was still wrong. Right? And there were, there were individuals who brought that up at, at uh, different points as well. Aristotle even mentioned some people think slavery is <clears throat> unjust by its very nature. So there were some people even back in that culture who said this is, this is wrong. So because it's not self-contradictory to think that some, good, some things that are approved of and called good for that reason are in fact bad, or some things that are approved of and called right are in fact wrong, we can't say that feelings of approval defines goodness or badness. We can't reduce statements about uh, rightness or goodness to whether they, they satisfy certain people's desires or feelings or anything like that. Same thing goes for individuals, too, by the way. He says that um, we reject the alternative subjectivist view that a, a person who asserts that a certain action is right or a certain thing is wrong is saying that he himself approves of it on the ground that a, a person who confessed that he sometimes approved of what was bad or wrong would not be contradicting himself. So the very fact that we have mutability when it comes to our moral judgments, uh, I can say, well, I thought it was the right thing to do at the time, but now I realize it was wrong. I approved of it, but now, you know, I, I see that it's bad that means that this can't be the, the right position. What about utilitarians? One of the benefits of utilitarianism is that it seems a bit more objective. Utilitarianism, broadly speaking, is a set of moral theories, let's call them, that all say that the principle of utility should be central. That is that we ought to act in such a way that from the various options that we have in front of us, we select the one that will produce the greatest positive outcomes and the least negative outcomes. And utilitarians very often will measure this in terms of pleasure, quanta of pleasure or happiness or satisfaction of desires. There's a number of different ways that you can do this. Um, Air here talks about uh, those three things. And then he also talks about, uh, here we go. He says, um, we cannot agree that to call an action right is to say that of all the actions possible in the circumstances, it would cause or be likely to cause the greatest happiness or the greatest balance of pleasure or pain or the greatest balance of satisfied over unsatisfied desire or however you want to define it. Because there were a number of different 
utilitarian standpoints that, that could be taken and, and developed. The same problem that, that, that he pointed out with respect to the subjectivist point of view applies to the utilitarian point of view. He says it's not self-contradictory to say that some pleasant things are not good or some bad things are to be desired. So we can't say the sentence X is good is equivalent to X is pleasant or to X is desired. And we also can recognize that sometimes there, there could be situations in which we would produce a great balance of pleasure over pain or a great balance of satisfied desires over unsatisfied. And yet we would say that it's wrong or bad to do that, that thing. So both of these are going to fail on those grounds as providing definitions of ethical terms. That is trying to reduce ethical terms to non-ethical terms. What about if we go to the other extreme? So Ayer says there are some people who realize that um, there, you, you, know, you, you might not be able to reduce ethical terms to uh, empirical concepts. Um, in which case, what are you, you doing with ethical terms? He says, um, in admitting that normative ethical concepts are irreducible to empirical concepts, we seem to be leaving the way clear for the absolutist view of ethics. That is, here's how he's defining that, the view that statements of value are not controlled by observation, but only by a mysterious intellectual intuition. I, I sense that thing, this is right and this is wrong or this is good and this is bad. And you have to have that intuition as well. He says, a feature of this theory is that it makes statements of value unverifiable. This is going to be a problem, right? He says, what seems intuitively certain to one person may seem doubtful or even false to another. So this is a, a initial problem with the theory, but you might say, okay, that, that's fine. We do have different standpoints. Not everybody gets it, as we would say. Not everybody has that same gut reaction. But could we provide some criteria? You know, if, if somebody doesn't get it, can we show them something that will help them get it? Maybe jog their memory. And Ayer says, well, no. He says, unless it's possible to provide some criterion by which one may decide between conflicting intuitions, a meal, mere appeal to intuition is worthless as a test of a proposition's validity. We can't give any criterion. Some moralists claim to settle the matter by saying that they know that their own moral judgments are correct. But he says this is a you know, purely psychological interest and doesn't prove the validity of any moral judgment because the other people on the other side can equally say, well, I know, I'm convinced, I have this gut feeling that this is the right thing to do. Here's my duty. This is what you should be doing or refraining from doing. It's not actually going to provide us with any sort of ethics that we can rely upon. It does, you know, not hold uh, the, the ethical statements to be reducible to non-ethical terms, but it doesn't actually tell us what those ethical terms are supposed to mean. So he, he goes on and he says that um, really what this, this, this comes down to is a position that a person can hold, but other people can't take on. Ayer thinks that the solution to this is in recognizing that ethical statements are not verifiable in any sense and cannot be reduced either to mere gut intuitions or intellectual intuitions or to some other set of empirical concepts that we can manipulate. We need to recognize, as, as we said before, that ethical concepts are actually pseudo concepts, that what they reveal to us is ultimately just an expression of preference or feeling or moral sentiment or the attempts to get other people to feel the same or to uh, produce action on their part, uh, acting as a sort of disguised command. So Ayer is going to criticize all three of these main approaches, very common in his time, in ethics, saying that the, the uh, radical empiricist or emotivist position that he is developing is superior to them.